Amen. Well, it's good to be back on the radio again today. We certainly do appreciate the good Lord allowing us to be able to come to you by means of radio. This is the Barrett Baptist Church broadcast. We certainly are privileged to be the pastor there by the Tim Crotts. We'd like to give you an invitation to come be with us in our church should you live in this area. I realize that a lot of folks who listen uh, live in other places, but should you live in and around the Cana, Mount Airy, Hillsville, uh, Galax area, we'd like to invite you to come and visit with us. Our church address is 100 Born Again Lane in Cana, Virginia, and that zip code is 24317. That is the physical address to our church as well as the mailing address for our church. We have Sunday school every Sunday morning at 10. Our worship and preaching service is at 11 o'clock uh, on Sunday, and then we have our afternoon service at 2 p.m. Uh, in the evening, then our Wednesday night service is at 7.30. We'd be glad to have you visit with us. You can visit our church website, BarrettsvilleBaptistChurch.com. Our church website, there's a button on there for sermon audio, and you can listen to all of our sermons that are preached here at the church by myself or others, and those are free to download. I'm sure they'll be a help and a blessing to you. Well, we're continuing today in Psalm 44. Uh, we have preached a couple of sermons from Psalm 44 already, and we will continue to do that today with the Lord's help. This is a Psalm of David. It's to the chief musician, the sons of Korah. It's a masculine Psalm, so it's a Psalm of instruction, and there certainly are many things that we can learn from the Psalm. Uh, probably the doctrinal overview of the Psalm is it is a prophetic Psalm concerning the uh, tribulation period in which the nation of Israel will go through the times of Jacob's trouble. And, uh, but we're looking at the psalm uh, to get some practical application uh, from the psalm. So we've already talked about the first eight verses of the psalm, and that has to do with boasting in God, for you have helped us. And those first eight verses are pretty much just a praising and a boasting in the Lord for all that he has done for them. Well, the next part of the psalm is a great contrast from the first eight verses is the second eight verses of the psalm. And so we'll be looking at verses 9 through 16 today. And the heading for that is forsaken by God, you have not helped us. And so let's pray together. We'll read these verses in your hearing and uh, pray the Lord to help us to be a great help and a blessing to you. Father, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to pray. Thank you for the privilege to be on the radio again today. Pray you would help us. Pray you would use us. Pray you'd give us wisdom and understanding and help us, Lord, to say those things that bring honor and glory to your name. Help us, Lord, to abstain from saying anything that would be contrary to your word or your way or your will. And uh, Lord, just use us to be a blessing to you and a blessing and a help to God's people. And Lord, should there be someone listening somewhere around the world, I pray that you'd speak to their heart uh, concerning their need of a Savior. Help them to be saved, we pray, even today. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalm 44. I'll read the first eight verses, even though we're going to be looking with the Lord's help at the last eight verses today. And as I read these first eight verses, try to keep in mind, if you will, uh, the, the topic or the heading that we have divided the psalm into four sections. And the first section, the first eight verses have to do with boasting in God for you have helped us. And this is how it goes. We have heard, verse one, with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days in times of old. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them. How thou didst inflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the hand, not the land in possession by their own sword. Neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hast a favor unto them. Thou art my king, O God, command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all the day long. 
and praise thy name forever, Selah. Now, verse number nine, we'll, we'll start reading here in just a moment, is the second section of the psalm. And the psalmist seems to be writing about the people feeling as if they're forsaken by God because he has not helped them. Now look at verse number nine. But thou hast cast off and put us to shame and goest not forth with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy and that which hate us and they which hate us spoil us for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat and hast scattered us among the heathen. Thou sellest thy people for naught and doest not increase thy wealth by their price. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. And so in these verses, we see a great contrast between the first eight verses and the second set of eight verses that we just read. In the first section, there is nothing but praise for what God has done and what God has accomplished for them. And then this second set of eight verses consists of complaining because they feel that God has forsaken them. Now, this second part could very well be that these verses are a prophecy concerning Jacob's trouble or the great tribulation period. And so verse number nine, but thou hast cast off and put us to shame and goest not forth with our armies. And so there are three complaints just in verse number nine or the first verse of this section alone. First of all, thou hast cast us off. In the previous uh, verse, they were boasting and praising God forever. And the very next verse, they, they make mention of being cast away. Do you see that? Verse number eight says, in God, we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever, Selah. And then in the very next verse, thou hast cast us all. That, boy, ain't that just like us? We boasting in God in one breath. And as soon as we remember, or as soon as something difficult takes place in our life, where'd you go, God? What have you done? Amen. And so just let me say this, and then we'll move on through some other verses. You know, the Bible says, so they made the statement, the first, first thing, uh, thou hast cast us away. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 11 and verse number one, it says, I say then hath God cast away his people. And obviously that's talking about the nation of Israel. And it says, God forbid, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now I'm sure that the nation of Israel is certainly going to feel like God has completely cast them away during the tribulation time. It's going to be uh, some of the most awful things you can even imagine or think about. And some of the things that we read about, we never even considered or thought about. They're going to be so devastating uh, during that time period. But God has not, and God will not ever completely forsake his people, Israel. Ain't that a blessing? Now, we too can rest assured, those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, that regardless of how often we may be, feel like or think that we are forsaken by God, we are not forsaken by Him, and we never will be forsaken by Him. Amen. You see, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5, the end of that verse, it says, For He hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Man, I sure am glad we don't have to worry about God leaving us or forsaking us. Ain't that a blessing? You know, the psalmist, we see it here in this verse number nine, and, but the psalmist often felt cast off by the Lord. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 43, the previous Psalm, and verse number two, for thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me 
off. Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? In Psalm 60, in verse number one, the psalm said, O God, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us, thou hast been displeased, O turn thyself to us again. In verse number nine, in that same Psalm 60, it says, Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Verse 10 says, Will not thou, O God, which has cast us off, and thou, O God, which didst not go out, with our enemies, or our armies, I should say. In Psalm 74, verse number one, the psalmist said, O God, why hast thou cast us all forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pastor? Now, this sounds pretty angry, doesn't it? Uh, th this verse also gives us a different look at Psalm 100 and verse number three, where the psalmist said, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Listen, he may be angry at us, but praise God, he has not cast us away forever. He may be angry with Israel and he will certainly deal with them and their sin during the great tribulation, but he will not cast away his people. Amen. Now, come back to the verse, Psalm 44, verse number nine, but thou hast cast off and put us to shame. Now, you know, the Lord has a way of crushing our pride, doesn't he? Uh, the Lord had won all of these battles for the nation of Israel that we read about and studied last week in the first eight verses. He has defeated all their enemies. And sometimes when the Lord uh, defeats all of our enemies, wins all of our battles, sometimes we want to puff up and, and pat ourselves on the back or, or, or beat up on our own breasts like we've done something and we get a little prideful. And so here we see that they maybe they've become boastful, maybe they've become prideful in what has been accomplished not by them, but by their God, and yet they get puffed up a little bit. And so he puts them to shame. You know what? If the Lord, if the Lord takes his hand off of my life, or if the Lord takes his hand off of your life for just a moment, we are certainly going to be put to shame. Listen, it, it, won't, it won't take him long. It won't take long at all, at all, man. Listen, I hope you haven't reached a place in your life where you think you have arrived or, or you think that you have uh, done something that is, that is worthy of praise and honor. Listen, friend, we, we have nothing and we are nothing without the blessings of God and without the help of the Lord. And, and one, listen, I don't want to live one second of one minute, of one hour, of one day without God's blessing and without God's help and without God's hand upon my life. I don't ever want to get to the place where I think, well, I can take it easy now. I can, I can just rest a while. I can tear down these barns and build greater barns because, you know, after all, I, I'm just going to pour all that into the storehouse. And I have all I'll ever need and, and I'll just sit down and take it easy. No, no, friend, we better keep on keeping on for the glory of God, for we have nothing apart from his help. We can do nothing and we can accomplish nothing without the help of the Lord. Now, I, I got to hurry. I got to move along. We're still in verse number nine. But thou hast cast off and put us to shame and go us not forth with our armies. We saw that again in another verse we read just a minute ago in Psalm 60 and verse number nine. They made reference to the fact that God did not go forth with their armies. You know what? We will never win another battle if the Lord doesn't fight for us. Listen, as a nation, we'll never win another war. We'll never win another battle if the Lord doesn't fight for us. Our church will never win another battle. We'll never win another war if the Lord doesn't fight for us. Individually, we'll never get victory over anything else in our lives if the Lord doesn't fight for us. Amen. Without the Lord's help, Israel's army was not all that impressive. And if we don't have the Lord's help, the Lord's touch, and the Lord's blessing, I promise you we're not going to be all that impressive either. Amen. There's no ministry that's going to be impressive. You might impress man. You may draw a crowd, but I tell you this right now, without the Lord's blessing and the Lord's help, you're not going to do anything uh, that brings honor and glory to the Lord. That's for sure. There's, there's a lot of people making a racket. There's a lot of people filling buildings. There's a lot of people who are having an emotional good time. I'll tell you 
you this, you're going to do anything from God. It's going to require his help and his blessing. Amen. Now look at verse number 10. We're in Psalm 44. Verse number 10, thou makest us to turn back from the enemy. Let me, let me just, I want to do this real quickly. Uh, I, I read these verses, verses 9 through 16. I, I realize that many of you are in a, in a place or in a situation, you're listening uh, to the radio or to the uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube, whatever the case may be, and you're actively doing something else. And, and I understand that. I do that a great deal. Uh, but if you're in a place where you can see your Bible or maybe later, if you remember this, you're looking at a Bible. Uh, the Bible says this. I'm, I'm just going to read the first part of a few verses here and because uh, they're making these accusations towards God. And in verse number 10, they said, thou makest us. Verse 11, thou hast given us. Verse 12, thou sellest thy people. Verse 13, thou makest us a reproach. Verse 14, thou makest us a byword. And so uh, in verse number 10, thou makest us to turn back from the enemy and they would hate us, spoil for themselves. And so they were at a time, they were at one time, they were destroying the nation of Israel were destroying their enemies. And now God is making them turn back from their enemies. It sounds as if they're running from their enemies in defeat. Now, in many, in many respects today, it seems at times like uh, the church is doing the same thing. We seem to be running from many of our enemies instead of facing them, amen. And just as God made Israel uh, turn from pursuing their enemies, I can't help but wonder if the Lord uh, isn't responsible for causing the church to run from our enemies uh, because of, of the sin and the wickedness and the apathy and the laziness and the, uh, the departure from God and the love for the things of the world. If we're not suffering a little bit of defeat because of our lack of desire for the things of God. Listen, we can't face our enemies because of our rebellion toward God and because of our uh, ignorance of his word. And we, we are living in such a time when there's so many, I'm talking about saved people, Christian people, good people, God's people who have a complete ignorance towards the word of God or for God's word. That's a shame, amen. Listen, he is our strength. He is our strong tower. And without him, we're no match for our enemies. May God help us to learn his word and to hide his word in our heart that we might not sin against God. So we won't be turning our backs to our enemies. Look at verse number 10 again. Thou makest us to turn our back from the enemy and they which hate us spoil for themselves. Now, we mentioned some things earlier about the enemy hating us. Here we see that the, the outworking of that hatred, those that hate us, will take from us. Now, it, it seems that, and I don't want to get political here uh, at all, but it seems that our government is leaning towards socialism, communism, and their goal is to install fear into the hearts of people in order to limit or steal our freedom. And the sad thing is that there seems to be very few people who care uh, that those who hate us are destroying us. And instead of fighting for or trying to protect our rights, they're just rolling over us because of fear. Uh, it's sad when any nation or any people will do this, but it, it's a horrific thing when it seems that the majority of the church is just giving up and giving in and rolling over and letting the enemy have its way with us. They're, uh, they're, they're, we're hated by the world. They're spoiling us. They're taken from us. And we don't seem to even notice it. Or if we do, we don't care. And so uh, they, they said, look, we've turned our back on their enemy and they're, they're spoiling us. Now, at least the psalmist knew that it was happening and said something about it. Listen, I, I want to I wanna say this. It's happening, and I want to say something about it. We need to turn back to God, amen, and, and rely upon him uh, and trust him to help us. Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11, Psalm 44. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat and hast scattered us among the heathen. Now, verse 22 of this psalm, I doubt we'll get it to it, get to it on today's broadcast, but verse 22 of this psalm says, Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. You know, uh, the, the, this verse is almost repeated in the New Testament in Psalm uh, 8, verse 36. The Bible says, As is it written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. 
We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, listen, this is a pretty gruesome thought that they're given by God to be slaughtered and not only slaughtered, but also consumed. What a horrible thought, man. He said, and has scattered us among the heathen. Also in verse number 11 of Psalm 44. So one of the results of being defeated in war is that many had fled into surrounding countries for uh, trying to seek shelter and safety, and many of them were being carried away captive. Now, all of this undoubtedly occurred at, at the time immediately preceding the ba- ba- Babylonian captivity as far as history is concerned, and it will happen to the nation of Israel again during the tribulation period. And, you know, Jesus, Jesus sent his disciples uh, or his apostles out as sheep among wolves. He said this in Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And so you and I should not be alarmed when we are not well received by the world, when we're not well received by the religious crowd, when we're not well received by those whom we want to preach and share and promote the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to. We should not be alarmed that we are given as sheep appointed to the slaughter. We should not be uh, alarmed when we're scattered among the heathen, but God help us to stand faithful to the things of the Lord. Now, this, this thought continues. Verse number 12, he said, Thou sellest thy people for naught, and doest not increase thy wealth by their price. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. Now, the commentaries, the commentators, and the theologians uh, that we read behind concerning these verses, they have a lot of different ideas concerning uh, these very harsh verses of, 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 of cruelty and reproach, and some of their uh, ideas and comments may even be correct. I'm certainly not saying that. However, from a purely practical application standpoint, let's view these verses as a warning to you and I who make up the church of today. May God help you and I not to become a reproach. May God help you and I not to become a byword among the heathen. It seems as if the church as a whole is losing the influence that it one time had in our country. Now listen, I, I hope you haven't got some kind of impression or idea that I'm down on the church. I, I'm not. The Lord Jesus Christ died for the church. I'm not talking about Bertrand Baptist Church, and I'm not talking about the Baptist denomination uh, either. I'm not a brighter. I'm talking about everyone that is born again, everyone that's put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. They are a part of the church of the living God. I'm for the church. Jesus died for the church. I am a member of the body of Christ. I am a member of the church of the living God. I'm in favor of it. But friend, your head is buried in the sand if you think for one moment that the church has not been losing, gradually losing its influence in America over the past several years, the past 50 years and even less. It has continued to decline the influence of the church has. Now, I realize that there are many places around the world where the uh, where the church has never had any influence. I understand that. And uh, many of those countries even uh, think about or refer to America as a Christian nation. But uh, we have lost our standing a lot. A lot of our standing has been lost. You know, I remember years ago, even people who, and I'm not that old, I'm older than a lot of you, but I'm not ancient, amen. I, I remember growing up as a child, even lost people had reverence for God. Even lost people feared the Lord. Even lost people would not do certain things because of the church. Amen. They had respect for the the house of God. They had respect for the, I hate to use the term, the so-called man of God, if you will. And they they had respect for Christians. They had respect for preachers. They they had respect for the house of the Lord. A lot of that is not the case anymore. They don't, uh, men and men, even women, they don't mind cursing and, and cursing God and cursing the house of God and, and cursing the preacher and cursing the man of God. Years ago, 
know. You would, you would not hear of that in, in America, but we are becoming a byword because of the sins of God's people. Amen. Because the people who claim to be saved are living lives that bring a reproach upon the name of the Lord. And because so many things that are uh, crooked and, and that are not pleasing to God and things that uh, have gone on at the church house, amen. And so we have gradually began to lose our influence and have become a byword among the people. Now listen. This is confused and is confusing to folks who desire to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord and they live so wickedly. And those who are lost, listen, friend, I'll tell you, lost people expect more of Christians than Christian people do. And I'm afraid that there's a lot of, of folks who are saved and uh, they, they have just taken it easy in Zion. And, you know, I, I'm going to heaven. I know Jesus is my savior and I'm just going to coast along, cruise, cruise along. I'm going to live just like the world does. My standards aren't going to be above those of the world. And I'll come to church once in a while if it's convenient or if I have time. And, and if not, and if there's anything that I can schedule on that day or, or anything else that I can do that day or any kind of, other, you know, I'll take care of my business on that day. I'll, you know, I, I won't miss work to go visit, but I'll miss church to go visit. And, and you know how it is. I, I, I can't miss work for a holiday or a fun day, but I can miss church for a holiday or a fun day. And, and so the world doesn't see much difference in people who claim to be saved. And so we've become a byword in our nation. Now look at verse 15. My confusion is continually before me and the shame of my face hath covered me for the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. And so the psalmist here is confused and is hiding his face for shame. Now, for his, not for his own behavior, but because of the behavior of those who have seen or have heard about the Lord's great delivering power. And what a shame it is that we boast in a changed life, being born again, and how God has set us free from sin and wickedness and ungodliness. And then for that individual to go back to that life, and it's confusing, amen. And so the Bible says here in verse 16, for the voice of him. Listen, someone is bringing a reproach upon the one that they were one time boasting in and praising. You know, approach means to blame. It means to, to treat with scorn or contempt. They are also blaspheming him, the Bible says in verse 16 as well. So, and the word blaspheme means to speak with irreverence toward God, to, to revile or speak reproachfully of God, to speak evil of God. And so the person who is speaking reproachfully and the person who is blaspheming is doing so because of the enemy, enemy and the avenger. Now, I, I personally believe that the enemy and avenger here in this particular passage of scripture in Psalm 44 uh, it, are the ones are one of the, and the same, amen. It seems as though the Lord is allowing Israel's enemy to avenge their prior defeats. Even though I have no, I don't claim to have a complete understanding of all that is taking place here, it is clear to see that someone is responding to their current set of circumstances by cursing God. What a horrible thing. Now here's the lesson here for us, and I gotta hurry. Here's the lesson here for us. Even when we can't explain the reason for our horrible situation, there will never be an excuse for us to ever speak reproachfully against God. Along with the psalmist, I too am ashamed at times by the response of God's people. Uh, and I, I want to hide my face, amen, in confusion. Especially when someone says that they're a Christian and they live a life in complete opposite or complete opposition of what the Bible has to say. Listen, I want to say this, and, I, and I'm done. My time's up today. I'm, I've been rambling here at the end. But I want to say this. If you claim to be a Christian, you claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're an embarrassment to those of us who desire to live for God 
and want to live for the Lord and you're an embarrassment to the church that wants to have a standard for God, if you claim the name of Christ and you intentionally live in such a way that brings confusion to that lost man who is not saved and knows better. And so God help us to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. Listen, you're going to stand before God one day, and I am as well. And I, I want to stand before him having lived a life that brings honor and glory to his name. And I hope you do as well. This is my time. It's quickly come and gone. May God bless you till we meet again is our prayer.